founded the Quantum Group here in Oxford. I take personal credit for being partly responsible for him being here. So we begin with Bob the Magnificent. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, thank you very much. Um, on yesterday morning we heard a lot about the universities and yet which some physicists might think is weird to be at this conference. On the other hand, in the afternoon we heard some very abstract quantum algebra stuff. I think not, not many people have seen the connection there. So rather than the title I initially announced, I'll just try to bridge these things that you actually see that what people were talking about yesterday are in some way at least connected. Actually in a fairly strong way. So the, the vague intuition is just look at these two pictures. You see they, at first glance, they basically are, could be part of the same thing. They are not. Uh, they both evolve others and pop for it. So there's some common things there. Uh, uh, right. So, so the context is like in 2004, uh, Samson and I wrote a paper, Ken Thomas, Method of Quantum Protocol, from which came some kind of high level description of lots of phenomena in quantum computing and more quantum physics more general, so recently, and which in particular introduced some kind of graphical calculus. Now, uh, it was a nice conference here in 2006, uh, which was called Cats, Cats and Cloisters, and at conference, Jim Lobbeck gave a talk, which is called Contact Model Catalyst from Linguistics to Physics. <coughs> that was a talk which has both words which are supposed to be topics of this talk in the title. It recently appeared in a very big book which I will recommend. It's called New Structures for Physics, which has a, a bunch of, which is not like a proceedings or anything, it really has a bunch of tutorial chapters specifically crafted for, say, people who want to understand this kind of stuff. So there's three category theory tutorials, one by Samson and uh, Nikos Tavadopoulos, uh, one by myself and Eric Paquette, and one by Joe Bias and Mike Stay. So I recommend that. For if you can open, most of these papers you can get from the internet, by the way. <laughs> uh, now, so at some, some very weird conference in Stanford, I met Steve Pullman, and he was, <laughs> he was talking there, but joined work with Steve Clark, which is called Combining Symbolic and Distributional Models of Meaning. That's what Steve uh, talked about last morning. And he kind of suggested to use Stanford Project for something. So we start to think about it, how to do that. And we used a bunch of the methods introduced here to actually kind of realize that. So that's the kind of stuff I'll try. You see, Lombic is very sort of common because that paper is going to appear in, in, in Lombic's fest shift. That guy has been around for quite a while, actually. <laughs> <laughs> He's still around. <laughs> okay, this starts. So I'll give a survey of aspects of categories and graphical languages. Not, very, not in mathematics style, more in a good field style. <laughs> So what is model category, uh, what, what is the connection of graphical languages with categories, and some known complete as well, because there's lots and lots and lots of open problems there. So you're really uh, touching upon the state of the art of parts of maths. So I'll then present some pictures of quantum state information flow, some pictures of linguistic meaning information flow, the difference between those fields, uh, fields and the flexibility of these. And that those, those, the last bit actually addresses the kind of thing which I sort of announced in the abstract. And it's, for example, related to some of the comments uh, Michael Boerthat uh, made yesterday. So why monodal categories? Well, because they are everywhere. Sorry for people who have seen it, because some things just stop being funny after a while. So I understand this might not be funny for some anymore. So the A be around to take them. Uh, so A, it's very nice state. It can be dirty, it can be clean, it can be skinned. And now we want to process A into good potato V. So V it's many states too, like boiled, fried, deep fried, baked with skin, baked without skin. And uh, so we actually represent this process of say boiling, frying, baking by little arrows which takes the brown potato to cooked potatoes. So this is the cooking process, the red thing. So when we talk about systems, we do it in blue. When we talk about processes, we do it in red. Uh, now states, states, everybody here has a feel of states because you, you live a physicist or a computer scientist and uh, so, so each has their notion of states and he, he, either of these notions is okay for the start. So a state is basically, well this is the state of my computer, this is what my machine is in. Or this is the state of my physical system, this is what, what my physical system is in. You don't really care who produced it, how high it, or how it was produced, as long as it is what people tell you it is. Then you're happy. For example, with this raw potato, if you want to start cooking, you're not going to start worrying which farm it produced, you know, or what kind of seeds you used. You just want a good potato. Right? So, so that is stuff you leave unspecified, and you think of a state as a process from something unspecified to what you end up with. So it, it sort of has the same shape, 
It has the same shape as one of those processes, as long as you introduce the notion of unspecified. Unspecified has very special properties. For example, if you combine a system with an unspecified system, then basically you've got the same system, because you think of this as really nothing. This is nothing. You don't care about it. It's outside of your domain of interest. Right? So, anyway. So now let's... Uh, this denote, this little circle denote the composite process of first boiling and then say salting, right? And we can also think of processes which do nothing, just which leave the system invariant. Now for physicists, they know very well that this is extremely hard to realize. It's extremely hard in physics to get the doing nothing process because systems tend to do something on their own. So you need to work really hard to get that to work. But anyway, if you get that to work like doing something and then doing nothing is the same as doing nothing and something is the same as something, of course, right? Yeah. And, uh, okay, so I already hinted that, that we should be able to consider two things at the same time. If you want to make an interesting dish, you, you want to use two very interesting things like a potato and a carrot. And then we can also look at combined processes. And you can, for example, boil the potato while you fry the carrot, right? That's uh, something you can do. And, uh, but this is not, not that interesting because you start with two separated entities and you have nothing to separate the entities. The kind of interesting stuff is where you start to match them up or something like that. So, so you start with two entities and you end with like one thing. So this would be meshing the spiced cooked potato and the spiced cooked carrot, right? And uh, so the total process is something like this, like a composite of a lot of stuff. Eh? And basically, by a recipe, we mean a composition structure and processes. Right? So, so that's, that's, that's what like, a cook cares about, recipes, composition structures and processes. And uh, a law, a law is then a thing which governs cooking processes. Like for example, like for example, uh, boiling the potato and then frying the carrot would be the same as frying the carrot and then boiling the potato. And, well, this, these are laws you have to know if you're a cook, because you, you need to know if somebody else, like next to you, is doing this and you are doing that, that you basically still have not be the same. It's the kind of things you have to know. So, you have know, laws for cooking. Uh, again, it's subtle because, it's subtle because, again, a cook knows that you're doing nothing is pretty hard because things tend to, that tend to become cold once they're warm. It's just, just, so, doing nothing really means doing nothing and being sure that things don't get cold, for example. Um, okay, now, the, what I'm talking about is like monoidal categories here. This, this what I talked about here is monoidal category, and this is a very versatile concept which has been very successful in proof theory and programming. But in proof theory, you think of propositions as your systems, and proofs as your processes. In programming, as the data types as your systems, and programs as your processes. And you can extend this to other fields, like you think of biological systems and biological processes, physical systems and physical processes, so why not language systems and language processes? Whatever that means. And that, that, that's kind of the thing we're going to think about today. Uh, so th this will be the focus here today. So we have this very general setting of these monoidal categories in which you can cast physics, like a view of physics which is process-based, like which takes the concept of process very serious, rather than, than say, description of, uh, of a system at one time. And, uh, and also a description of language which takes process very so it's all going to be a little bit about information flow. Um, so here is minimal language for quantum reasoning. So I already gave you this kind of idea. So you start with systems. These are physical systems. This can be an electron, uh, whatever, like uh, some field out there, I don't know. Or this can be the classical data you extract in a measurement of a quantum system. So you've got processes which take a physical system of one type to a physical system of another type. So this can be like a, you've got some photon and then you measure it, which typically destroys the photon and you end up with like a, like a little spot on a photo, uh, photographic plate. So that's of course a very different thing than the system you start with, like your live photon. So these things typically are not the same. That's a concept physicists don't seem to ever very much have thought about, the idea of time. Yeah. It's kind of very strange though. Which which I, which I blame for all of the, the difficulties in the foundations of quantum mechanics, in like really understanding physics very well. Uh, we got a notion of compound system. This just means I've got system A and system B. So at this stage, this doesn't really mean the tensor point. It doesn't have to. It just means I've got two systems. I happen to use this notation at this stage. I've got the nothing system. Huh? And then I've got compound processes. 
And I can I have temporal composition of processes too, and the doing nothing process. So this is the the monoidal uh, this data which you stick in monoidal category uh, with relation to physics. And then then this monoidal category has this very nice feature which traces back to Penrose, and that's the kind of stuff we saw a lot about uh, yesterday afternoon in uh, John Majid's talk and, and then also in Bertrand's talk. That you can actually represent these things graphically, and the idea is very simple. If you do something after something else. Well, then you represent each of these things by a box with an input and an output, and you just plug these boxes together like flowcharts. It's a very intuitive idea. Uh, a little bit strange, you might, especially if you come from physics, this looks a bit strange that the tensor product is just like putting two things side by side. It's nothing more. It's nothing more than that. Uh, so, well, so the question you can then ask is this merely a notation? And it turns out to be a lot more than just a notation because. If you, for example, take this law, you can think of this f, g, and k at least as linear maps. You can think of this as like composition of linear maps, and this as a like penciling these things together. And this is a non-trivial, this is non-trivial law. Now, if I write this down in this graphical language, then I get a topology. So this sort of shows you that going to this graphical language isn't just a different convenient notation, but you get rid of a bunch of garbage, you could say. There's lots of garbage left, and there's many, many, many more of them. Because what I'm going to talk about here is like strict stuff. It means I do everything up to equality. Well, if you would look at like category theory of certain mathematical structures, then things are mostly only true up to isomorphism. And that makes that you get a horrible definition for something which is called a symmetric monoidal category. It's a horrible definition if you don't do it diagrammatically. I think that's what, that's what scares people from category theory, especially because kind of interesting category theory, which I think is a monoidal category and stuff, they call it horrible syntactic definition. So, so if, if mathematicians, because mathematicians have a big problem with this graphical language, is if they see a proof, they don't really think of it as a proof. They say, ah, I only believe it if you can also provide a syntactic proof next to it. They don't really believe this stuff. When you see something like this, ah, that's nonsense. It doesn't make sense. Uh, so here is an example in our setting of what this specific law means. It basically means spilled the potato and then fry it while clean the can and then boil it, which is the same as spilled the potato while clean the can and then fry the potato while boil the can. So it, it's kind of a general logical, it's like a, a logical law in cooking. And the one which I gave before, like where you could change the order, is actually a special case of this. You can show that you can derive this. So this is this is like the key law of monoidal category. And with the graphical language, it's gone. It's gone, you don't need to care about it. But it's not gone, it's implicit. <coughs> but it's, it's not something you have to take, carry around. Right, so now I'm going to introduce this notion of state. So for a state, we start with nothing and get something, and we depict this just by not depicting an input. So we depict this by a little triangle like that. So nothing goes in, something comes out. And then the dual to that is something goes in, nothing comes out. It's like a destruction. And if you plug these two together, you end up with, you end up with something without an input and without an output. And these are things physicists know very well. Again, I apologize for people who have seen this like 20 or 30 times. <laughs> this joke's just so 40 or 50. What? I'm about 40 or 50. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, physics know this stuff. That's usually how they that's like the, the, the great the great inside of Dirac. Like to write a physical state like this. And and then then they have this notation which they call bracket and which gives you actually a kind of this is actually where compositionality was sort of sneaking into physics in this notation. Unfortunately, like physicists are like a lot of macho guys, and like when, when I, I remember when I was studying, I was studying physics in a good school, and they didn't like Dirac notation because it didn't really work in infinite dimensions, and if you didn't do infinite dimensions, then you were not real. It was sort of the <laughs> mathematical physics attitude of the previous century. So anyway, that's why this Dirac notation wasn't taken too seriously until I would say. Quantum information people that start to really embrace it and got all of the advantage out of it. So anyway, you see this thing? Now I close this and then you get this triangle. So the six triangles are already sitting there. This is the other thing which we have introduced. This is like a bra. You close it and you get a triangle if you turn it around. And this is the important one. If you compose a cat and a bra, then you get an inner product. And again, so I'm gonna do the same game. And so you see this 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 little Silly graphical tool is actually an inner product. So it actually catch, captures an essential feature of quantum mechanics. It allows you to express, for example, what unitarity is, uh, all kind of like interesting stuff. Now, you need to have a manner to 
turn a cat into a brown, like such a triangle into such a triangle. So you extend your language with flipping things upside down. Like in, uh, in quantum mechanics, it's flipping things upside down boils down to the adjoint of a linear map. So, this is not, so you see, it's a very silly operation again, but it boils down to taking the adjoint of a linear map. Anyway, so now the thing is you want to talk about quantum mechanics. And one of the very important things about quantum mechanics, which, which, which traces back to Schrödinger, like in 35, he already realized that the, the real, he, he sort of said, a lot of the people were worrying about completeness and stuff like that of quantum mechanics, and they kept on worrying for 50 years about that, whether you could come up with a hidden variable theory and stuff like that, and worry, worry, worry. But Schrödinger was sort of more looking forward when he said, hey, we need to understand the way systems combine, combine because that's really the essence of quantum theory. And basically, what happens there is, if you've got a classical system, like for those who know category theory, this means, for me, this means something like Cartesian category. If I represent two things, if I want to talk about two things, then it's good enough to say what one thing is and what the other thing is. In which state one thing is and which state the other thing is. So you can represent the triangle representing the whole thing in two chunks. This is not possible anymore in quantum mechanics. So this is due, due to the use of the tensor product for describing compound systems. So, uh, of course, this is like a negative statement. So can we now assert this idea in a constructive way? Like, like uh, as a, that, that it becomes a structural resource in your theory which, which allows you to reason. And uh, so we're going to, yeah, we're going to say in our theory there exists stuff like this which we can't decompose. So for a physicist this would be a Bell state, for example. This would be a Bell state, which is used like in EPR experiments and, and quantum teleportations and things like that. Now how do we assert that something like that doesn't fall apart in two pieces? Well, I claim this is a good way to do that. The reason that this is a good way to do that is... And if you think a lot about it, this is like the most obvious way to assert this. So basically what we have is we've got this state here, we've got the same one flipped upside down there, and we claim that this funny configuration, so you start with a system, you've got then this funny combined state, then you apply, this is, this is called this an effect. You may think of it as like a measurement, it's like a measure, post-selected measurement bench. You observe something, it's like observing and destroying, like observing this photon with a photo plate and then it's dead. Huh? And uh, something comes out there. I claim by saying that this thing is like an identity, I assert that this cannot decompose because look at it. If I would be able to decompose it, then you see something like you start somewhere and it goes to nothing. And then you got something which comes from nothing. So it's a completely disconnected thing. And you can you can kind of understand if a straight wire, like an identity channel, which does nothing, becomes the same as something which is completely disconnected. Then you're in trouble, right? And you can show theorems there that just if you have stuff like that, Samson has a sort of no Chloe theorem, that if you've got something like that, then everything dies. So you've got this totally stupid theory, you can't stick any content in it. Because essentially, what you have is that whatever you stick in here, it's this one that comes out, always. It's like a constant map you get. So if the identity becomes a constant map, you're in trouble. So, so that's why I say this is a good way of asserting this idea of any compounds, uh, like generally null states. Now, be, because this is such a special state, we're going to represent it by cups. We saw this in Sean's machine start yesterday. He started talking about these cups. And this for us will be the key thing, like to represent these special states. And indeed, we find like this Yankee diagram, which we saw yesterday, by asserting this idea that you can't decompose systems. Now, what can you do with that? But well, you can actually start to build a theory with that surprisingly, with nothing but that. I should say that you might talk, no, a lot, uh, so Michael Muger and Sean Mazitsak yesterday they were talking about braids. For me, in, in this talk, this thing and this thing is the same. So I, I don't make a, dist a distinction there. Uh, now, suppose you've got a physical process. And I actually represent this in an asymmetric manner so that I can see when I flip it and all that, right? You take a physical process, you insert the special state here, you insert the special effect there, an identity and an identity there, and that defines a new thing. And I'm going to denote this new thing by a 100 degree rotation of this guy. Just this is not the, the 180 degree rotation is a way to represent this compound, right? Then I can prove something, because we, we, we want to prove stuff. Uh, Otherwise, we feel dissatisfied or something like that. I don't know. Um, so, okay, so 
Here you see this 180 degree rotated stuff, and I sort of depict the other guy as an internal structure here. You see, I put it inside just to see that inside this box section, this is what, I, what is there. So what can I do, for example, I can take this little wire, <laughs> and yank it, and then I get this. Or I can take this little wire, and yank it, and then I get this. Or I can just hide the internal structure, and then I get this. Right? And so what you see now is, you've got this box, and you can sort of slide it, you slide it over, and it's as if you can slide these boxes over these wires. See, that it, it, it all boils down to cleverly denoting this thing by a 180 degree rotation. And that, so it's kind of funny, now this really becomes nothing but a wire, along which you can sort of, it's like a chain with, with pearls, you can sort of feel it. And that, that's, that's your reasoning principle. <coughs> and like in, in physics, well, in, I mean, in linear algebra, this thing, this 180 degree rotation turns out to be the transpose. So flipping was the adjoint, 180 degree rotation is the transpose, which means that the combination of them, which is like such a reflection, is a conjugate. You just, you just con so you've got a language here that gives you an angle, uh, a handle on adjoints, conjugation, and transposition of matrices. We are actually talking about matrices at all. So, right. So, for example, this is something in my language here. Uh, you see, I take this guy, this is a true statement, I slide it here, I get this. Like, if I now, for example, require this F to be such that if I compose it with its flipped one, then you get the identity which uh, in, in linear algebra means an isometry, or more specifically, you can think of this as unitarity. Unitarity means you take something, you compose it with its adjoint, and you get the identity. So we are, and unitary maps are actually the kind of things you can realize in physics <coughs> and in close situation, close non-interacting situation. So basically, we throw this away. Now, we reintroduce our notation of triangles again, just to, to, to get a clear view on what is state and what is the measurement. And then we introduce these two guys, Alice and Bob. And so what you get is the process of quantum teleportation, which, however, although how trivial it is, you see, it was very trivial introducing this language. This is something people came up with in 92 or something. It is like more than 60 years after the birth of the, not the birth of quantum mechanics, but the birth of the Hilbert space formalism of quantum mechanics. So people never saw this in the Hilbert space formalism. They never saw something simple like this. And you see, it's really this very stupid little bit of wire joke. <coughs> Now, how did this work? So I'll just give a clip. Like, this is stuff which is uh, experimentally uh, realized. Like, people do this from one side of the leg of Geneva to the other side. So what do they do? Alice is at one side of the leg of Geneva. Um, Bob is at the other side. They share an entangled state. So they share. So there is a pair of systems. So Alice has one, Bob has the other. But since we're doing quantum mechanics, this may be a system of this kind. This may be in a state of this kind. Then Alice does a certain measurement on some incoming system. She doesn't know what it is. I don't depict it because it can be anything. It can be anything. Typically, you don't know what it is. So you measure there those two together. You get a measurement outcome, which I represent by this F. She sends the measurement outcome to Bob. So she takes the phone. And typically, this, <coughs> typically, this is like a qubit, which means it's an element in two-dimensional uh, Hilbert space. Like it's, conti it's, a, it's, a continuum. it's a continuous piece of data. Right? Well, this is typically a number between 1 and 4, because you do a measurement on two qubits. So she sends the number between 1 and 4 to Bob, then Bob does a certain operation, and as a result of this finite communication, whatever state was here, now is at the other side. So what, what, this, what the physical phenomena we see here is that with finite resources, you can communicate infinite data. If you just have such a stand, uh, entangled state as your disposition, and this this kind of idea is the basis for lots and lots of lots of uh, like a quant new quantum mechanical phenomena and protocols and key exchange. It all boils down to things like that. Here is another example which is a little bit more sophisticated. Uh, for example, you start with four systems A, B, C, D. You do a measurement on B and C. This is a measurement on B and C. Again, you do some manipulation on D, and you end up with. Well, not surprisingly, maybe that B and C are connected, but also that A and D are connected, despite the fact that you never acted on them together, and initially they were not connected in any way. So, so it's, it's, it's a similar idea like teleportation, that you can do all this kind of... It looks very trivial in the pictures, but as a physical phenomenon, it's like, it's weird. It's very weird. And this is, again, thing with, uh, something which is using quantum information. If you want to communicate over long distances, this is a way to sort of 
because it's very hard again to establish these things over big distances. As you see, you can have two short ones to build one large one. So the way to composing distance and communication over distance. Uh, this, okay, so we can change the scenario a little bit by sticking in something here, sticking in something extra here. So we, within this state, we built an over operation in. So this is again a state resource. But then via exactly the same form of reasoning, you can see that rather than identity there, you could have something else. So this would be the thing you get if you commute this to what we do on, this, on, the, on the other side. And this turns out to be a, a model of computation, a universal model of computation, which has a lot of advantages on a standard quantum computational model. And it's, it's part of a field which is called measurement-based quantum computing. I think Ross Duncan will say a lot more about this later. Um, but the reason I go to this is because here, we will find a very nice analogy with the linguistic stuff. That's why I wanted to show this uh, logic gate teleportation. But basically I'm showing there's a lot of stuff you can actually do with these graphical languages. Now, now there's, like, there's actually more structures to physics than this, it's not, which is not surprising. For example, when we are talking about teleportation, then I said something about Alice communicating to Bob. And it would be nice, for example, if you see this in the picture as a wire too. It should be a different wire than this one it's sort of classical communication. And you can do that. And there's other stuff you want to talk about, for example, like, uh, Ross, are you going to talk about complement and observables? Not really. Not really, okay. So there's other stuff in physics, like, comp like you know, uh, um, position and momentum duality, like we know position, don't know momentum. And so if you want to articulate these things, then you have to go to a more sophisticated language, which are, not, which are, which are maybe very, well, I'm probably not going to talk about it there. But let me now, so this specific language which we introduced is uh, the language of dagger compact symmetric monoidal categories. And so there is a theorem in the spirit of the Joel Strip uh, theorem we heard about yesterday, which says that whatever you do in this language is true even though only if it kind of can be done in a corresponding syntactic language, which is one of these categories. Now a far more surprising result, the result very recently, again due to Selinger, is that an equational statement in this dagger, compact, symmetric, monoidal, categorical language holds even and ends in diagrammatic language which I presented even though only if it holds in the category of finite dimensional Hilbert spaces, linear maps, tensor polyp and edge ones. Uh, that's like this true, is not derivable. What? That's like true, not yeah, 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 okay. So, but this, this statement has to be qualified in a couple of ways. I'm not going to do this here because I'm not... So there are a couple of qualifications which have to do with the dimension of Hilbert spaces. So, but roughly put, whatever you can prove in quantum theory, in the language involving stuff like this, which is states, operations, effects, unitarity, edge ones, projections, bell states, effect, transpose, conjugation, inner product, and stuff like completely pos complete positivity, which are all fancy concepts, these things can all be expressed in this very simple diagrammatic language. So whatever equational statement you can prove involving these, you can prove diagrammatically, and vice versa. You can only prove it in Hilbert spaces if you can prove it diagrammatically, which is kind of a powerful statement. So this is just to say that these graphical languages can be extremely powerful, and they can capture huge fragments of like your physical theory. Uh, okay, so now I just showed this because, you know, uh, yesterday Bertfried was talking about Frobenius algebra, and like these dots you see here are actually Frobenius algebra, and this is a far more complicated model. Each of the such dots, such a green dot, actually co corresponds to a base, a base in a Hilbert space. And these are phases, so there is, a good, there is some extension of the graphical language. Well, there, you should be a little careful in... in, in uh, no, no, sorry, oh, 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 you talk after. <laughs> <laughs> this is a question. <coughs> hey, you, you, you keep going over time, so... <laughs> you're not going to sneak out my time. <laughs> So anyway, so this, this, this kind of dots have very, very simple uh, uh, reasoning ways. If you see a dot like that, you can basically fuse them together, these from being a And while here you see a fairly complicated uh, physical scenario where you've got a state, which is a pretty complex bunch of measurements, then the, there is a graphical language which basically just fuses them all together and tells you that, for example, you implement an arbitrary one qubit unitary. So this is again a model of a... Ross, you're going to talk about measuring based quantum computing, right? So this is again a very fancy quantum computational model which, in which this sort of languages are extremely powerful to tell you what you do. Okay, now a slightly different language for natural language meaning. So I've, I've laid the basis for that. So 
Okay, so what we're interested in is the following. Everybody here knows what a dictionary is, and you know what you can use a dictionary for. You use a dictionary to look up the meaning of words. Now, when I'm, when I'm talking here, I'm talking in sentences, not in words. I'm just not throwing words at you. And for some reason, there don't exist dictionaries for sentences. So how is it that when we hear a bunch of words, we know what it means? So something must be going on there. So you've got a bunch of words which are represented in my usual way now, meaning, like a state. But it, there is something which makes all these words in a sentence, if you've got a list of words, make up some meaning. So a lot of triangle. Uh, uh, well, the thing is, of, to, to, to give you an example of what these things could be, like for example, for, I'm not at all a specialist here, so, so that's the kind of thing Steve was talking about yesterday. This could be vectors in a big vector space. That's sort of what Google does. Like meaning of words for them are vectors in a big vector space. Yeah? Now, how can we compute the meaning of a sentence? So maybe we want to represent this by a vector too, for example, in a big vector space. So how do we produce a vector or whatever else by composing the meaning of a sentence? And it turns out that, well, grammar obviously has something to do with that. Grammatical structure is kind of what guides you, what guides the meaning of words and meaning of sentences. So, right, so, so, so we basically now are talking about information flows between words. Like, because you see here, you see all these words, and there is wires coming in. So you, so you assume there's a bunch of wires inside which connect all these things up in some way. Well, wires or something else, maybe not something else than wires. And again, we're, only, we're in a situation that this thing won't typically break up in two parts. Because if you look at a verb, a verb takes an object and a subject and then produces something, a meaning. So you would at least assume that there is some connection here and there is some connection there. So we're again in a very similar situation. And so why not try to use the same language, you would think? And well, one big difference, of course, is that the order of words is reasonably important when you talk. You know? So we, we have to deal now with something which is not really commutative in any way. So you have two caps, left and right, and all that stuff. Uh, I don't, I don't dare to use this name because Salinger is always telling me that you shouldn't call this compact curse in any more non-commutative compact curse. I think, how does he call this? And then we call it compact two category. Huh? Compact two category. Oh, it could be. No, this is not necessarily there. It's yes. not necessarily even two it's category. It's an extraction. Why should it be two category? Well, it's the easiest way to write it. You can write it as a star autonomous non symmetric category. No, I think Salinger, they, they have been fighting about terminology there. I, I can't remember what he wants. Okay. Just called left and right duels. Left and right, yeah, left and right duels, but I think, yeah, left and right duels, yeah. I think he calls it autonomous or something. Like left yeah. and right autonomous, yeah. autonomous, yeah. So anyway, for meaning, uh, so for meaning, basically you take vector spaces, you take linear maps, and this gives you a compact, a compact, an ordinary compact closed category. Uh, for grammar, I give just one example. You could take something like a pre-group. And again, this turns out to give you a compact closed category. And if you then plug them together, then you get something like a compact, well, one of these left and uh, autonomous, left-right autonomous categories, which basically give you some way of like splitting up language in its grammar part and its meaning part. And for the physicist, like a very funny way to put this down is you could call this a grammatical quantum field theory, because if you know what a topological quantum field theory is, it's exactly the same idea. But rather than cobordism, you stick in grammar. And you get, you get like functor from grammar to, to vector spaces rather than from, say, a category of cobordism or, spa or space time to vector spaces. So basically, what do you get then? So it's a little bit the same idea as we saw before. You've got a bunch of words. And then this stuff, this stuff comes from grammatical structure. So we saw things like that in Michael Mordkat's talk yesterday, like how to talk about grammar words, also Steve alluded to that, and it turns out that he can use this, this is something Lambe came up in, in around 2000, came up with, and, well, it's basically, you've got this thing, and now you see this couple of words here, like does and not, and then you can start thinking hard, what does does do? Does doesn't do much. Does is just a bunch of wires, which sort of guides the flow of information. Not does a little bit more. It kind of introduces a negation. So you can give models to these states, which are sort of logical operations in terms of these information flows. You, again, now I'm going to, and then you can sort of do the same trick, the kind of yanking bit. And you see that these all 
Ah, oh, fuck. So what I did yesterday is I had all these pictures upside down and I swapped them all and I forgot to swap this one. <laughs> so this one you should read upside down. So what you get is, so oh, let me write it for so, it's so confusing. For some reason, when, whenever I made these pictures, I put them from, 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 from top to bottom because language is sort of written, uh, you read language like that, but physics, when physics talk about time, they usually go up. So, so. Right. And it's really annoying if you have to think in both. <coughs> this is what you get. Um, right? So you get reduces, and then you can easily compute, given you've got the meanings of all this stuff, you kind of compute the meaning of your sentence. Right? Uh, so what are the analogies and contrast? I'm going to use two, three minutes. I don't have much. Uh, like basically, you see, the grammar sort of plays the role of the measurements. You, got, you start with this resource state, like in teleportation. You do some measurement, and you end up with something else. And here, you, got, you start with your meanings as vectors. You apply the grammar, and you end up with the meaning of a sentence. You see, it's, it's a very nice analogy there. There's, uh, and then you, you can sort of then, then go a little bit wild and say, well, we talk about normal locality when we mean in physics that these two states are apart and connected by a wire. And you find also sort of normal locality in different languages. This is taken from a paper of Merlouche. And see, for example, in Persian, it's very non-local. Persian is very non-local. Words communicate like when well, they are far apart. So it's kind of a funny analogy there. Uh, there's also an argument, a nice, which I find particularly a nice sort of a methodological uh, analogy. You've got some physical theory, but you've got some linguistic theory like this. So we've got these high-level interaction structures, which are the language in which we describe them both. But then you also have to do experiments to actually justify your theory. And of course, we do this in physics, but we do this in linguistics too. If you come up with a theory like this about the information flow, then you have to see that this works. So what people do is, I think at Grevenstedt, he's going to give a talk about this, this, this bit. And Steve was, of course, also talking a lot about that yesterday. So the kind of experiments you have to perform to justify your theory. Uh, so again, here are the analogies, states, me, there's stand, are like meanings, measurement, like grammatical structure. Here you want, here, well, if you do topological quantum computing, you want to go braided here, for example. Yeah? But for, for, for this story, the symmetric thing is the natural. There you go, non-symmetric. Uh, uh, well, phases, I don't really know what you can do with this in language. I'm not sure. Basis, well, recently, I think Marco is here. Oh yeah, so in, in, in this master's project, it sort of came up that we can use this basic structure to model for words like that and things like that. And Steve Clark, in a very, in a past life, once told me that they use density matrices like that for stuff too. I can't remember for what. He once told me that you should. <laughs> so that's like mixing in quantum mechanics. I can't remember, I can't remember for what, but he did tell me something there. Uh, so structure requirements. Um, I, so, what, what, so this is now the lambic versus lambic. I was initially planning to talk mainly about this stuff, but I thought it was better to give this, this survey, to give, put this a little bit in context. So, so here uh, we saw pre group in Michael Moore that stuck yesterday. We saw uh, Christian algebras, which were not even associative. But with the same idea, this, but it's always the same idea, like to analyze the sentence structure of, of, of some, in some language. So, uh, what is the mathematical structure which you use here? And so there are many, many different candidates. And so just because we yesterday here we talked about this non-associativity, I just want to show that so this is if, if you, where does associativity play a role in these two contexts? So you've got a tensor here, you've got a tensor there, and you see to go from this pair to this pair, you need associativity, right? It's sort of built in the graphical language, but that's where it's sitting. The same thing here. But well, now. If I got here a tensor, and there's something else, and they don't really associate, but you got this weak distributive line, which we heard about yesterday, you, st you still get the same picture, essentially. So you see this, I find these slides and I have to do this. But you see how easy it is to go from associativity to non associativity. <laughs> <laughs> so rows, rows, you see. <laughs> so anyway. This, this, of course, this is not, a, this is not a, a big proof, but it does show that this kind of weakenings don't really interfere with the whole recipe. 
And so I've been look I I'm not at all a specialist, but I've been looking at all the kind of things people have been throwing into the like the market of available grammatical theories. So there is the residuated pomonoids of Lambic from in the 50s. There is something earlier which Bar uh, adjunct, adjunct, I don't know the name. Bar Gilel pomonoids, then there is something protogroups. There are the Grishin pomonoids we heard about yesterday. Well, that, well that was yesterday was no associative even. But as far as I can see, all this stuff works. Like, uh, the, the kind of idea you have here, it all works. The problem, the problem is there, and then you have to go to the state of the art, is that we don't really understand the graphical language flow for all these situations. Intuitively, it all seems to work, but there are no theorems. Like, I, could, you could, I think the state of the art of the graphical languages is in a very nice paper by Sullivan, who really went digging, and actually found that even in papers by superstars like John and Street, there are quite, there are some bugs and caveats, and, and so there are, it's a very tough thing to do this thing, like matching like algebraic categorical structure to these languages. And uh, bias and state, they, for example, start to introduce a way to graf uh, gram uh, graphically deal with situations where you wouldn't have a pre-group, but just a closed structure, which some people also use in the grammatical things. And it all seems to work. You get some, the graphical language obviously is going to reflect the kind of trees we saw yesterday in Steve's talk. It's sort of going to be building in your graphical language rather than all these cups and caps. There are no real theorems there, it seems, so far connecting a particular graphical language to say, so there's work to be done, but it doesn't mean it can't be done. It's, it probably can be done. So just somebody has to sit down and prove a bunch of theorems there. Okay, that's it. Why not start from, for example, from a group-oriented base, where the associativity would not be a 
to. But then the rest of the structure would be exactly I would, the same. No, no, that, that was my main. Like for the things we've done with quantum computing, is all this perf. It's just here. That's what this slide was about. Like what are really your structural requirements to tell this story? And you can, for example, here, like I've, I've got a different... I've got a different tensor than, say, like a cotensor. It's like a, a star autonomous category in here, right? Or, or something weaker. But the, the ideas still seem to carry through. But you need, uh, uh, you need a different heuristics. I, so I think in abstract terms, uh, the kind of problem I was trying to, to communicate yesterday was to find a natural mathematical system in between uh -huh. a socially more community and a socially more uh -huh. community. Yeah, sure. No, I agree. That's, that's what I was actually hinting. And there's very little known there at the, at the level of... Uh, say, this, this great diagrammatic language, or anything like, say, even completeness as well, even only that, right? There's lots of stuff to be done. This is not a very well developed area, given the potential, I think. And last question. Uh, yes, I want to ask you, um, uh, what do you take that for meaning? Because as far as I understand, uh, words uh, as vectors, uh, seems to me that meaning is like lexical meaning. Uh, or do you think for kind of idea also to say, why the sense of me? Uh, you don't have to ask me, I'm not a linguist, I know nothing. Yeah. Like, like, because you know, it's, like meaning, it's, 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 it's very close to what you are uh, presenting. So, but meaning is also structure inside as a center, say, is a, a uh, set of, uh, of properties inside. Uh, I agree, okay. No, no, of course, uh, again, again, this is, this, this, is very, this is very pragmatic. There is this problem, like yeah. people Google as vectors or, or whatever they use. They're vectors, they want to compose meaning so that you can actually, what rather meaning? than typing words, type sentences with your genuine grammatical structure, can you understand, um, can you assign something like a meaning? The, ma the main idea of vectors is because you can then compute them in a product for similarity. And we saw this in, in Steve's talk yesterday, like that you, you get these parts and they can find words which are very, have very similar meanings just by computing in a product. And that's the idea you want to do here. You want to know when sentences are similar, si simple by com uh, computing in a product. Yeah. It doesn't mean that this is like, I mean, in the, in the ideological sense, a good way of doing meaning. This is pure statistics, and statistics is what you use if you don't understand anything. No, I mean, what my remark is that it would be interesting to understand the things such as an app or a semantic of the Sure, sure, no. It is not a lot of what is really like, like, in uh, I think Ed and Mernouz, they are doing some slightly more yeah. sophisticated things there. Ed, we talked about it. Anyway, so I think anyway, we should uh, terminate the discussion. Thank you again.